All right, hey, I'm Doug Bernauer, the CEO of Radiant, uh, and we're building Earth's first mass-produced nuclear reactors. So uh, this is what power looks like in the country right now. Uh, there really hasn't been an appreciable amount of power uh, added in about 20 years. Uh, and if you look at all these neat colored dots, you'll see a whole bunch of coal power, a bunch of wind power. Um, you see hydro up in the northwest. Uh, and there's a bunch of nuclear reactors, right? About 20% of all electric power in the US is coming from nuclear. So every fifth time you charge your phone, that was atoms being split to do that, uh, which is quite cool. And a lot of that was added in the 1970s. Um, but what you also see is uh, there's a lot of intermittent sources and uh, a lot of coal use, right? So all that wind power and all that solar, those little yellow dots, that'll go away during the day, and you need some other reliable backup, um, whether you're a military base um, or, you're, you know, just in one of these locations where there are all these gaps and really only coal power up in the Rocky Mountain region. Um, so there are these isolated remote areas that just don't have accessibility to power and, and uh, resilient power especially. So if you look at uh, Alaska, Right, you've got these tiny little dots, that's all diesel fueled locations. There's a lot of coastal communities, um, right, fisheries and things. Uh, and then Hawaii actually is primarily diesel fueled, which people wouldn't expect or realize, but it is the most remote location on Earth. Um, and so that uh, makes a bit of sense. So uh, I'd just like to show these because everybody's from somewhere here, typically, right? We're from the US, and you can see where you're actually getting power from today. Um, and then this, this slide is really uh, about the history. Right, so you see total electric power almost flat for the last 20 years. Um, and we know that natural gas has been rising, right? That's the, the, the leading po power source today. Coal has been coming down. Nuclear has been built way back in the 70s and 80s and has remained solid, um, right, consistent. We haven't added new plants. We haven't really shut them down. Uh, the, the plants run for about 60 years. They've had license extensions. They're actually pushing to do an 80-year extension. Um, but that really large nuclear power these, these plants are 1,000 megawatts. They have to be located near water uh, to be, to be uh, utilized. And uh, you can't make a nuclear reactor as a product when you're making it at that scale. So um, I was at SpaceX for 12 years. I joined in uh, 2007 when they had failed two rockets, had zero successful rockets. And uh, I worked on this grasshopper rocket, first one with legs, which took us a single year from Elon going, I want rocket with legs, to we have FAA experimental rocket permit. We're out in the middle of Texas flying the thing around. Um, and from there, I did Boring Company and Hyperloop and Mars Colony Design. Uh, when I did Mars Colony Design, I found that you can't power Mars with solar power. You really need to have megawatts of power to do fuel production so you can bring a starship back. Uh, and so that led me down this path of looking at nuclear um, and caused me to leave uh, in 2019 to found Radiant. Uh, and we have a lot of uh, team members from SpaceX. So this is what we're working on, right? Uh, portable mass-produced microreactors. And uh, all that power data I showed you earlier is about these 1,000 megawatt systems. This is a one megawatt reactor you can make in a factory uh, at about 50 units per year. So picture a nuclear reactor per week coming off of a line. Uh, that can then be moved to anywhere the customer is. Um, so this is just a little vision of that, right? There's a uh, customized trailer. The box has uh, power generation equipment and shielding and a reactor with fuel in it. And then at a customer site, it looks like this. There's a concrete shielding bay that's required for, uh, uh, to keep the, the land use area small. So these are four units. That's about four megawatts of power that can be inserted over a weekend. The concrete is prefabricated, so that, that takes a couple, only a couple of weeks to put in. Uh, when you do that, you've got four megawatts on 4,000 square feet that uh, lasts for about five years before it needs refueling. Uh, and of course, you can uh, delay uh, the consumption of power so that only one unit is down at a given time. So you can have an extremely resilient power source. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, the interesting uh, customers for this are data centers, hospitals, military bases, uh, et cetera. So how do, how do we make this work? Um, it's uh, pretty simple, I'll stay high level. Right? You've got a stainless steel pressure vessel, uh, weighs about eight tons. That's, uh, inside of that, we've got uh, precision machine graphite and nuclear fuel inside of a core. Uh, there are actuators under it that rotate control blades in and out to turn on and off the reactor and control power generation. There's shielding around the unit uh, inside of the package, and that's used so that you can meet transportation regulations from the Department of Transportation. Um, and that allows you to shut down a reactor 
and then 30 days later ship it down normal public highways in the US. Um, so there's a helium, oop, I'm gonna go back one, sorry. There's a helium circulator, um, which is just a pump that pushes helium in at 50 bar pressure into the, into the reactor pressure vessel that's coming in at 400 Celsius, going through and coming out at about 700 Celsius, transferring heat across a heat exchanger and then coming back to the pump, and that's circulating this closed loop of helium. Um, on the secondary side, we've got a turbine that we spin using a CO2 working fluid at 300 bar pressure. Uh, that then, uh, there's a alternator here, and we, we have, make about two megawatt of shaft power at 31 kRPM. Um, and then spin this, make electric power, and then there's a compressor that pushes the fluid through all these heat sinks and heat exchangers, and then back into the loop. So there's two closed loops, one CO2 loop here making electric power, one helium loop here, transferring heat out of the core. Uh, and so uh, this is nothing like the really big uh, reactors that you find powering the grid, uh, nothing like uh, a submarine's reactor either. Uh, we use what's called triso fuel, these particles, uh, and one of those is about the size of a poppy seed, so they're extremely tiny, and our reactor core is actually is about this big, about as big as this table, uh, has about 120 million of those tiny particles in it. Uh, purpose of which is to seal all the little kernels of fuel in a ceramic coating that handles super high temperature, so it's a meltdown proof reactor. Uh, added, the downside here is cost, of course. It's expensive to coat all those little particles. Um, we also have a helium uh, coolant, and so that primary loop where we transfer heat out of the core with the helium is very purposeful because the, the helium in the system is extremely stable, can't become radioactive. So if it leaks, there's a helium gas that will just float up and away. Uh, not creating any environmental risk, not creating any personnel risk, so you can have that four megawatt on 4,000 square feet right next to you. Uh, there's also a power fail safe, so we don't need power to pump uh, coolant through the system. And that's really because of the high temperature rating and the very small size. Um, what can you do with that? So this is a, a little image of a, a small system, about four megawatts, that can, uh, in the event of a grid outage, turn on sources in a, and this is a, a military base, as an example. And so you can do critical load shed down to the amount of reactors you've installed, keep the, your critical missions alive and operating even when the grid goes out. The system is also built to bring the grid back on when it, um, when it detects that the grid is available again. I've got uh, all the other use cases here. So uh, of course you could use these for small data centers um, or to adapt and add a few megawatts of power in a city where it's a huge challenge for customers to get a uh, utility to add megawatts to their facility or a, a remote site where you've got you know, a million dollars per mile to add power lines. Um, and so that can support critical minerals mining. You can turn on overnight, even in the middle of nowhere where you have no power today. You could do 1.8 million gallons of desalination in a day um, or power really remote Arctic sites, uh, Thule Air Force Base, Greenland, a uh, bunch of interesting places that have challenges today. Uh, and this stuff is all real. So <laughs> this is the first iteration of our helium circulator. This is a, this is a 16 kRPM turbo machine, um, and this is a, a cast Inconel, about 800 pounds of it, uh, bigger than a Falcon 9 turbo pump. Uh, but this pushes the fluid through the system, and this, all the other parts here are really like simulating the, the components of the reactor. Um, we also built up a reactor in September and then used electric heat to uh, get it up to its full operating temperature with helium. Um, really uh, took us only about one month to assemble this. So it was very easy to put together all the parts. Uh, the trouble is access to the pieces. And of course, this has no nuclear fuel in it. So it was a little easier. Um, and uh, so this is showing some of the precision machine graphite and uh, welding. Uh, there are about 260 temperature channels, uh, along with uh, total channels, I should say, uh, in that system. So we use this to validate that passive cooling functionality, uh, where we don't need a pump, uh, even if power goes out. So we're extremely close to having this. We will, in 2026, that's just next year, in about one year we'll put fuel in at Idaho National Laboratory, turn the reactor on, go critical, go all the way up to full power, so that's a full scale unit demonstration. That's done under DOE authorization licensing, which is another and separate thing from NRC licensing. Uh, and we're on a schedule to deliver a first unit to a customer in 2028, scaling up thereafter to that 50 units a year. Uh, and then, of course, this is just a first product, and you can do different things, right? This is a space reactor design that could be used. So uh, if you've got a product uh, that uses power, whether that's a satellite, um, right, or, uh, or a critical infrastructure, military base that you've got, you want to power it, you're not using nuclear today, 
you should come talk to me or my team over here at this event. Uh, and you know, you might be waiting in line quite a while if we don't start talking very soon. We, uh, we actually just uh, locked a 20 unit customer deal. Um, that's like a billion dollar deal uh, to build these. <laughs> All right, uh, out of time. Thanks, everybody. Uh, this is a great event.